those types of stains and patterns that require very little energy. Uh, simple drops of blood falling, only affected by gravity and air resistance. And you have uh, drip stains, drip patterns when there's several drops falling in the same place. The drip trail, uh, when you have drips of blood falling and there's movement, that's what you call it a trail. And flow patterns uh, are volumes of blood that move according to gravity, whether they're coming down a vertical surface or on a slanted uh, horizontal surface. <clears throat> Saturation and pool are related to one another. Uh, they can essentially be the same volume, but saturation refers to a volume of blood that's on a surface where it has been absorbed into the surface, whereas pool of blood on a harder surface, it remains in a two-dimensional configuration, doesn't absorb in, so that's why we make that distinction. And let me uh, let me ask you, I, we, you may have, maybe I missed it, but you may have skipped it. What is a transfer uh, stain under this passive category? All oh, right, I started with drip stains, I'm sorry. A transfer stain is a stain created uh, when you have a, an object or portion of a person that has wet blood on, on that area, and they come in contact with a, a non-bloody surface. They, they transfer the blood from one surface to another. And there are two types, basically, of transfer stains. One are called wipes. A wipe stain is uh, when you have blood pre-existing on, on a surface that is not quite dry, and you wipe through it, and you create what we call a wipe pattern. And by contrast, uh, we have a term we call swipe, S-W-I-P-E. And a swipe pattern is where <clears throat> you have blood on your hand or on another surface, and you look, give lateral motion on a surface, just creating a swipe. So we make that distinction. Sometimes we see both in the same area at one time, but we do make that distinction. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about spatter, and you might notice a bottle of water in front of you now. If, if you well, thank you very much. Feel free to I take appreciate that. Get a little raspy throat here. Um, spatter, please, if you could. Spatter, um, spatter requires more energy uh, than passive dripping, and as a result, the stains are generally tend to be much smaller because they're broken up into smaller droplets. <clears throat> now, impact spatter... Uh, is one category, and just like what it sounds, it requires an impact of some sort onto exposed blood to create a, an array of small spatters that may radi radiate out from that surface. We have uh, impact spatter can be produced by uh, beatings, sometimes by stabbings, uh, <clears throat> and also by gunshot. Okay, but the key to that is the blood generally has to be exposed when the impact is made. In other words, a single knife wound generally will not cause any spatter because it's not impacting any blood that's already been exposed. We have a secondary spatter, which you will hear me talking about satellite spatter. And that is a secondary spatter, which occurs when blood is dripping down onto a surface, forming a relatively small or large pool and the drip after drip creates uh, small spatters that radiate around it and land on your area surface around and um, finally uh, for spatter projected spatter is uh, a type of uh, pattern that we see when an artery has been damaged because the blood is exited under pressure and we can see I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry? I didn't mean to interrupt if, if you weren't done. Go ahead. Oh, um, and that's what we call a projected. You can also get projected uh, spatter uh, from exhalation of blood coming out of the nose and lungs under not as much pressure, but the same sort of idea. And then finally... Uh, talk about altered, please. Hmm? You talk about altered, please. Yes, let me just say finally. Um, altered stains... Uh, Actually, can the uh, altered stains can affect all the other types of stains. It's an alteration of stains that have been produced over on these two categories of passive and spatter. The first one is uh, clotted blood, 
is after blood has been exposed uh, to an external environment, it begins to clot. And uh, the time of clotting varies a lot, but uh, generally you can see beginnings of clots within three to 15 minutes or something like that. And of course with clots, you then will get what we call serum separation. The liquid portion of blood uh, will appear because the clot after uh, extended periods of time will come together and express and the serum will be around that area. And it looks like a pale yellow type of a liquid. Uh, diluted blood uh, really speaks for itself. When you, you mix uh, blood with some of the liquids such as water, you get a dilution. And we can certainly see that as a result of that activity occurring. Uh, dried blood, of course, uh, is something that starts right after blood has been uh, produced. The drying generally occurs from the outside in, whether it be a small stain or a large pool. Uh, and of course, uh, the other one we're going to talk about a little bit are voids. Voids are just what it says. You have a pattern of blood and uh, something produced and there's a, a blank space in the area. We call that a void where blood should have been. Okay. And you see various types of voids. Okay. Talk to the jury a little bit about sequenced. Is, is that a reference to an ability to understand sort of the sequence of a bloodletting event based off its appearance? Yeah, so sequencing uh, is something that you try to do with transient reconstruction, which blood stain pattern analysis is a tool in order to help facilitate that. Um, but sequencing also, another good example, sometimes I'm asked, well, here's a, 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 a footwear impression on, on the floor, and there's spatter, which appears to be on top of it. Can you tell which occurred first? And that's, that's called sequencing, if you can be able to do that. Another form of sequencing is uh, essentially a white pattern that we talked about. If you have a stain on the, on the floor and you wipe through it, you sequence that by knowing that the stain occurred first, and then the wiping came afterwards. So is it possible by using um, this discipline, this science of bloodstain pattern analysis for you to help, um, or for you to be able to reconstruct sort of the order of certain events within the scene based off the appearance of blood? Yes, that, that is our ultimate objective, is to uh, <clears throat> use bloodstain pattern analysis and also you know, general crime scene knowledge. I mean, what I mean by that is like various objects that may have been moved uh, throughout a situation. But blood stain pattern analysis is a, is a part of the overall uh, job to reconstruct whatever happened. We need the results from the pathologist, what type of injuries occurred, because that assists us in determining where someone may have been based the type, on the type of stains that are occurred. If there was an arterial cut and we see one at a scene, we have to verify that, that there was an arterial cut on the victim. So those are all the things we have to deal with. In addition, and probably most importantly, would be the uh, testing of the blood, uh, and especially for DNA analysis. And I've been working with this uh, in this field well before DNA uh, became you know, actually used in forensic science, and uh, it's made a big difference in being able to distinguish between, for example, when you have more than one bleeder. If you have three victims at a scene and there's a lot of movement around, DNA is about the best route to take to determine who went where. Um, okay, let so me. That's why that is important. The ultimate goal when you're where you are uh, brought onto a case is not just to come in and describe stains, it's to try to describe stains and then understand what can be inferred from the appearance of those stains. Yes, well, <clears throat> a good way to point that out is that when we teach basic blood stain pattern analysis courses, uh, and we teach law enforcement most of the time, we've had pathologists and we've had some, law some attorneys you know, take the course as well. Um, a basic blood stain course will teach one to be able to document properly blood stain patterns, meaning uh, proper uh, photography, uh, proper collection, and things of that sort. 
Uh, it does not make one an expert, which is really a court term. I mean, I, I refer to it more as experienced. You gain, you gain experience by taking an advanced course and then doing a lot of casework in order to be um, come qualified to testify about the subject. All right. Were you asked in this particular case to review um, some of the evidence to see if you could offer any opinions in this field of bloodstain pattern analysis and crime scene reconstruction? Yes, I was. Can you tell the jury what it is you reviewed? Okay. Um, I read the date of approximately uh, April 1st of uh, 2019. I was contacted just before that. Um, not by you, but actually by a, uh, another attorney, State Attorney was on the case, and uh, I received the following items to review. Scene photographs, uh, some scene videos. Can, can you tell the jury how many scene photographs you looked at? Oh, I'm sorry. And 916 images and scene videos, uh, about uh, 20 clips of videos. Uh, photographs of uh, Danielle Redlick um, at the scene, and there were 22 images of that. And then uh, photographs of her at the hospital, there were 53 images taken of her. Then to go on, on April 3rd of 2019, I received a scene report and some diagrams of the taken by the Winter Park Police Department. Um, Investigative summary report uh, from the same agency. I received uh, F uh, FDLE, uh, Florida Department of Law Enforcement uh, laboratory reports of blood analysis and DNA, and uh, also reports of their fingerprint analysis. And then all right, and of course, we're going to continue to follow the kitchen knife murder trial. Uh, we will bring you the latest on that, bring you back inside the courtroom for more testimony ahead. You're watching Court TV Live, your front row seat to justice. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Joy Lim Nakron in for Julie Grant this afternoon. We continue our coverage of the Kitchen Knife murder trial. Defendant Danielle Redlick out of Florida is standing trial accused of murdering her own husband, Michael Redlick. She claims it was self-defense. Now we have been hearing for from a forensic consultant for the prosecution, uh, Dr. Stuart James. So let's bring you back into court. The uh, driveway. And that so, which I, which I just made note of, they, did, they were not part of my conclusions in this case at all. So we'll look at the next PowerPoint titled Danielle Justine Redlick at scene and hospital. What do we see here um, at this at this slide? Well, you can see uh, Ms. Redlick there. Uh, standing with, well, go back one. You can see there's apparent injury to both her wrists and with uh, her hands are relatively clean, but the wounds do not appear to be bleeding. Tell the jury the type of stain that we see uh, present here in this photo 162. Yes, I, I would classify that as a transfer stain, meaning that a, <clears throat> a bloody object or portion of a person with blood on it, wet blood, uh, made contact with that area of the neck and created a transfer stain. Next slide is a close-up of those injuries that you previously described. Yes. And now we're looking at photographs of Ms. Radlick in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Is this a close-up of that transfer stain that you previously described? Yeah, the close-up, uh, the only difference between that and the previous photograph of showing a neck was that the blood on her neck is that kind of crusted and flaked a little bit. It's older than it was when we first saw it. And do we also see what appears to be some sort of transfer stain sort of towards the bottom of her neck as well? Very, very light a transfer. 
additional uh, photographs of the state of the injuries at the hospital? Yes, and you can see there's a small accumulation of blood, uh, <clears throat> especially on the on the left hand toward the the base of the palm. <clears throat> Here, where my cursor's at. Yes, that's correct. Um, what are we looking at, and what do you see in terms of the stains that you're observing? Well, here on both the left and the right uh, foot, you can see uh, more uh, extensive transfer stains. In fact, on the on the left foot, the uh, stains uh, come part, you know partially up the, the leg slightly, but mostly is on the toe areas. <clears throat> And then the bottoms of the feet in the next slide. Yes. Uh, here we see more transfer stains on the soles of the feet. Uh, the shadow makes it a little more difficult to establish the, ex the extent of it, but there's definitely some reddish brown stains on the soles of the feet. <clears throat> okay, the next presentation entitled Foyer. All right, so what do we see here um, in the first slide of your foyer presentation? Well, we're seeing uh, both on the left and right uh, photograph, we're seeing uh, some apparent blood stains uh, on the interior portion of the door. And looking at those, uh, they would be classified as, as flow patterns, meaning the volume of blood <clears throat> that was applied to that area was of sufficient volume to allow gravity to pull it down toward, toward the floor. And we see a better depiction of that in the next slide, photo 3282 cropped. Yes. And <clears throat> you can see, uh, even by gravity, the particular stain above the doorknob has followed the contour of the actual lock and just then continued down. It's being governed by gravity, basically. Based off of your overall review of the scene, your knowledge of the injury sustained um, in the entire context of, of your review, did you believe that, th that these stains were more likely associated with Danielle Redlick's bloodletting event than Michael Redlick's bloodletting event? Well, yes, to the extent that uh, she was just outside the door where, when she was photographed. So, but at least uh, <clears throat> someone, you know, made contact with the, with the interior knob to get, out of the, to get outside, presumably. Okay. But the blood was not tested, so I, 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 I can't say be for certain. certain of that. All right, photograph 3261. Uh, on the other side of that door, and we're seeing some, some patterns I'd like you to begin to describe for the jury. Yes, well, right by the edge of the door, you're in that area there, uh, you have uh, three uh, fairly well-formed passive drip stains. They're more circular in nature because uh, <clears throat> the surface of the, of, the, uh, of the floor is fairly smooth, so you don't get too much distortion. It'll be essentially round. And around this area, you see what uh, very smaller stains, which could be classified as satellite spatter. The result of the blood drop hitting the floor and then a few small spatters emanating from that as a result of the impact of the floor. Okay, next slide, photograph 3074. What patterns are you seeing and, and what is it? what are you able to infer from the appearance of these patterns? Well, what we're seeing here is uh, Almost the entire floor is covered with uh, a large area of reddish brown stains, which uh, even from looking at this perspective, uh, some appear to be diluted. It is not in pristine form. And diluted in this context means that some liquid has been mixed with the, the blood that was present on the floor. Yes, because uh, the the whole area of this of the floor, these stains are much lighter in color than they would be if the blood was whole blood. 
So it's been, it's been altered to the extent where it's been diluted. And we're looking at some additional photographs of, of the floor from this formal living room vantage point? Yes. Okay. So now photograph 3077. This is the main area around Mr. Redlick? That is correct. And we're going to see kind of through the remainder of the presentation some close-ups on some areas of interest in and around Mr. Redlick? Yes. Okay. What does the jury see here, what, or, or what can you see here, and what can you tell the jury about the, the patterns that are present um, sort of towards this bathroom and then off heading towards the master bedroom? Well, essentially what I'm seeing in this photograph is on the left side, uh, below the area where the brown chair is, uh, what I'm seeing there is a large area of wiping of blood. You can almost see some some circular motion applied at the right at the base of the side of the chair. So that's near where blood was wiped up to a certain extent, not entirely, but to a certain extent. Would an object such as a towel produce a pattern like we see in the floor in this area? How would what? A towel. Would a towel be an object that well, could produce that Yes, pattern? any object capable of absorbing some blood and being white, yes. All right, um, photograph 3018, sort of looking back the other way, what do we see as far as the patterns of blood? Well, we're seeing uh, another large area of what I would consider diluted blood, very light pink in color, uh, extending down to the south, down the hallway. And then in the foreground, uh, there's what appears to be several areas of, of drip stains that we saw by the front door, meaning that blood had dripped from a, some height above onto that area. The next presentation we're going to look at is titled South Side of Residence. All right, explain to the jury uh, what you've highlighted here and what this pattern appears to you to be. Well, that area <clears throat> has a linear, a linear configuration to it, if you will. And I don't believe I mentioned it uh, in, in the first presentation, but that I would re refer to as a cast off pattern. And what I mean by that is uh, if you have blood on an object or your hand, uh, and it's swung, uh, you're going to cast the blood off. It's going to go onto a nearby surface or as far as it can go until it reaches the surface uh, and look at, in a linear, linear type appearance. It can be on a wall, it can be on a ceiling, depending upon the orientation of, of the swing. So that's, I would classify that as a, as a cast off uh, pattern. All right, next slide. Photograph 3416 and 3418. Why was this significant um, and why did you include it in the slide? Well, here we have a variety of, uh, of uh, objects to talk about. Number one is a pile of clothing, uh, of which I believe also contains the shirt of Mr. Redlick. <clears throat> and that's designated by evidence marker number one. Uh, number two, I believe uh, shows a a mop that which is actually le leaning up against the banister of the stairwell, and the the mop uh, has a reddish brown appearance to the the, uh, the 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 bottom portion of the mop. And number three is a bucket which appears to contain a large amount of of reddish brown water. A mop and a bucket, are these the types of instruments that could produce the scene that we see surrounding Mr. Redlick's body in those prior photos? Yes. It would be producing dilution as well as wiping. Our next slide, photograph 3474, help the jury understand why you included this slide and, and how it factors into what you can say about the scene and the appearance of the blood. 
Well, it just shows you that uh, that location is where Mr. Redlick's shirt uh, was was placed, because you can see the the uh, the damage to the shirt corresponds to where his the location of his of the stab wound in his upper left chest area. And we're seeing a close up of that bloody mop that you or the the reddish stained mop that you just discussed. That's correct. Okay. Photograph three four. Two zero. What do you see here? Well, there you see some uh, some transfer stains that have been diluted, and another another uh, consideration of dilution is that you know blood dries from the outside in, and you can see the rim of drying has begun, and that's why the the periphery of that stained area is darker than the center. Uh, Mr. James, there is a laser pointer right there in front of you. Oh, okay. Um, and so if you, if it would aid you at all to turn around and use that to kind of point to some of these stains. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to do that, but my neck is, may give me a little trouble doing that. Okay. But I'll try. Um, do your best. Whenever you think it would be useful for the jury to understand. Mr. James, are you able to stand up and do it? Would that be more comfortable for you? Turn like this. If that's more comfortable, yes, sir. That would be easier. Okay. Here, I can try that. It makes, how do you turn that thing on? Okay, good. All right, you, you were talking about how it dries from the outside in, and we see an example of that here. Yes, you see these uh, diluted areas here, very light pink in coloration. And what I was talking about is that the periphery of these stained areas has got a darker appearance to it. It means that it's begun to dry. And uh, that is true of uh, the same areas on the other side of the, of the photo. You may have already mentioned this, but do you also see a, a pattern that is consistent with being a, being a footprint? Yes, yeah, so right here it's kind of vague, but uh, that does appear to be have characteristics of a of a uh, the sole of a foot. What about to the left, also right right to the left of that? I'm sorry. L to the left of that, right there in the center. Oh, right here. Yes. What appear to be uh, I'm not a footwear uh, analyst, but I, I can certainly say consistent with a portion of a bare foot. Okay. <clears throat> okay. All right, so you have been watching a live testimony in the kitchen knife murder trial. We're going to take a quick break, but we'll be right back and bring you back live into court. With Shopify. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Joy Lim Nakron in for Julie Grant this afternoon. We continue our coverage of the kitchen knife murder trial. Defendant Daniel Redlick in Florida stands trial accused of murdering her own husband, Michael Redlick. And by the way, her husband was also her former stepfather. She's claiming it was self-defense. We've been hearing from prosecution witness Stuart James, a forensic consultant on the stand, testifying about blood found on the scene, as well as an apparent cleanup. Let's bring you back live into court. Next photo, 3317. Do you see some stains um, on that towel that you can describe? Well, I, I see, <clears throat> I don't see a lot of saturation, but I just see, you know, some transfer stains uh, right near the evidence marker number 12. What about around the towel? And around, we can, again, we see more of the drip stains. We were talking about the circular drip stains, some satellite spatter, and... Uh, you can see some of the uh, stains have been been altered. No, let's go back here. Like right in here, you can see the, the outside perimeter is darker and the, the center is clear. And some items uh, that were set on that towel. Okay, well here also, can you go back? No, there you go. You can see here some very obvious areas of uh, some serum separation. Uh, and here, for some reason, you've got this towel, which contains a bloodstain 
cell phone, uh, <clears throat> let's see, uh, eyeglasses, keys, uh, which uh, have been placed there after the blood was on them. Okay. Um, all right. So now moving back to the area around Mr. Redlick's left arm and that lamp, tell, tell the jury the patterns you could observe from this particular photo. Okay. Um, here we're seeing, again, more of the same. Uh, we see more drip stains that have been altered. Uh, you get a very, a very good image here of, of the serum separation. Here's a major, big, uh, large blood clot. And you can, the serum has emerged because the clot has retracted. And this is all that uh, white, yellowish material or liquid, which still contains some blood, but it's certainly uh, serum separation. And you can also see uh, an area where I believe his arm was up here possibly for a short period of time before he came to his final position. What can you say about the location of the lamp and the stains that are um, under the lamp? Yeah, the lamp. And on uh, the lamp. You can see a large white area at the base of the lamp. And in my opinion, the lamp was moved where the base is on top of a portion of the wiped area. And also you see some uh, stains on top of the base of the lamp as well, which have fairly dried and maybe formed a few clots, but uh, mainly it's been moved to be over a previously wiped area. Is this an example of the sort of reconstruction or sequencing um, that you can offer through the appearance of the evidence and the blood stains on the scene? Yes, to determine which came first. We know that the, the wiping occurred first and then the lamp came after, was moved afterwards. So we had blood, wipe, lamp. Correct. And again, we're seeing another image of uh, this altered blood stain, which uh, again, my only explanation is with some chemical or something like that was applied to it. All right, what are we looking at here? Here we're looking at a, a, another area of the living space. Um, <clears throat> and number 12 is another uh, towel or, or, or shirt laying on the floor. And then do we do a close up of that table in this next slide, photograph 3544? Yes, here we see uh, some deposition of uh, blood stains on top of the table. Um, the ones on the right are more linear, well, more linear than this, but that would have some features of possibly uh, fingers coming in contact and just moving a little bit. Um, there were also uh, a bit of that on this side as well. Let's talk about the cup that is also placed. Yes, the cup, uh, the glass uh, shows some blood transfer. So it was touched uh, with a bloody hand, most likely. Looking at another angle of, of Mr. Redlick, um, what are some of the stains that you can begin to uh, identify on this portion of his, his body? Well, we see some transfer stains on, his, uh, on the right side of his abdomen and you know, mid chest area, which would be right in this area here. You see some transfer stains on his arm and his arm is resting on a previously uh, wiped area. So there's been movement of, of his arm um, that occurred uh, after the wiping occurred. Because the wiping does not go across his arm, it's below it. So someone had to have wiped that area and then manipulated the body? Yes, okay, yeah, moved, yes. Manipulated, moved, yeah. Three, two, four, five, and three, three, one, zero. What are you focusing in on in this particular slide? Well, here we see uh, we see some transfer stains on the wall and the lower the lower wall and the baseboard, and you see a uh, blood stain towel next to it and, and his arm. 
Um, there's also some small spatters, which are down at the baseboard. Um, again, uh, this area has been altered. Uh, I can't say specifically what caused those transfer saves, but a possible candidate would be uh, his right arm, but it would have to have been, the body would have to have been a little closer to the wall for that to occur. Okay, so we've been listening to that testimony from a forensic consultant Stuart James for the prosecution. I want to bring in now forensic criminologist Dr. Lauren Petler joining us in Monroe, North Carolina for analysis. I understand that you know this particular witness. Uh, what's your impression of, of how he's uh, describing what happened with the uh, kind of blood, pa um, blood stain pattern analysis? Oh, you know what, Joy? He is doing a, a great job explaining to the jury a very complicated topic. It's very difficult to take um, years and years of <clears throat> knowledge and experience and translate that to to terms that a jury can understand. So basically what I've been listening to Stuart do, and I've known Stuart for probably 20 years, um, he was my teacher and I've also taught with him. Uh, he was one of my bloodstained teachers. But he is explaining to the jury what not only what the patterns are and how we come to call them by name, such as a void pattern or a wipe or a transfer, but he's explaining to them how they are created. Because one of the most important things to remember about bloodstain pattern analysis is that it's all grounded in the laws of physics. So gravity is extremely important when it comes to bloodstain pattern analysis. And looking at it to measure like the size of the stain and the shape of the stain. And by doing things like that, we can tell not only what, where blood came from, but we can also tell how high above the floor or how far away from a wall the blood source was when it left the blood source in this case, the victim or maybe the defendant, and then traveled through the air either to the floor or to the wall. So he's explaining also where it was cleaned up or where it was attempted to be cleaned up, which crosses, of course, into uh, the world of staging a scene. You know, that's the only reason you're cleaning it up before you're calling the police. And I was gonna ask you about that. You know, you mentioned the blood being not just from the victim here, but potentially from the defendant as well. I wanna ask you about the possibility of perhaps a staged suicide attempt. What do you think? Yes, yeah, so one of the things to keep in mind when you're talking about stabbing deaths and stabbing murders is that the defendant oftentimes gets cut during the assault because blood is super slippery and it, it really gets slick on the handle of that knife. And then sometimes if they're, if the person, the offender is stabbing the victim, the hand of the offender can slide down the blade. And then you be, have these mixtures of blood that they find at scenes where DNA matches both the victim and the defendant or, you know, majority of one or the other. But yes, it's very slippery and it can cause a lot of injury to the, the weapon can cause a lot of injury to, to the defendant as well. Wow, yeah, that's incredible to think about and, and just to see those images and put it together with the testimony and analysis. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Laura Petler. You're welcome. Um, joining us from Monroe, North Carolina. And of course, we're going to continue our coverage of the Kitchen Knife murder trial. We'll bring you back live into court ahead here on Court TV. Pet endlessly better. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Joy Lim Nackern in for Julie Grant this afternoon. We continue following the kitchen knife murder trial. Defendant Danielle Redlick stands accused of killing her husband, Michael Redlick. And he used to be her stepfather, by the way. She claimed she was acting in self-defense. We've been hearing from prosecution witness Stuart James, a forensic consultant, testifying about the blood patterns that he analyzed as well as an apparent cleanup. Let's go back live into court. Hallway or whenever in dripping blood, uh, you'll, you'll see a drip trail. Uh, you may or may not see directionality, depending upon how fast they were walking. And then if they went down a hallway and came back, you generally would see a second drip trail going, you know, 
not too far from it, but there'd be a pair of them, one going up and one coming back. I can't say in this case because it's, it's been too altered. The entire scene? Yes, totally altered, yes. What do we see here, photograph 3396 and 3398? <clears throat> Here, here we see some uh, some small spatters that are, if you look closely, you can see they've got a downward directionality, so they're coming from top to bottom. Okay. Um, and now moving kind of farther towards the primary bedroom in photograph 337, continuation of that white pattern with the directionality that you previously discussed? Yes, and here's a better example of the feathering I was talking about. See, it's more concentrated here, and then it lightens up. That's why I was saying directionality, you know, going, looking at the photo from, excuse me, from right to left. That's what I was talking about. Photograph 3341, what is this a useful photo? Uh, yeah, that's, to a, describe. that's another good example of the wiping, but you also see uh, right below that, you can see some altered stains that have begun to dry. You've got the, the outer perimeter area, uh, and then you've got some small spatters over here, which may also be just some dried flakes of blood. Um, again, here, here's a good example of, you know, stains that have begun to dry from the outside in, but the uh, centers are, 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 are uh, void, so that is more indicative of wiping, especially right here, too. These all used to be drip stains before they were, they were wiped through. So this is another example of sequencing, where the, the blood was deposited, there's sufficient time for it to dry from the outside in, and then it's wiped through, but that dry part is still left. That's correct. Okay, um, continuing to follow that pattern as we move towards into the primary bedroom. Yes, the pattern uh, <clears throat> continues, uh, you know, through the hallway uh, around to the edge of the bedroom. Could you just go back one? Yes. Yeah, you can see where the bedroom is. Uh, and then it, it turns in uh, toward the, the bathroom. And we're seeing that pattern in this next slide, photograph 3347 and 3346. Yes, again, uh, more wiping area. If, if this area was not wiped, you would see more drip stains. And you may be able to tell more about what happened in the scene. If, they, if, if, if the wiping had not occurred, there was, I believe, a lot of information was lost by, by the wiping. Destroyed. Objection. Sorry. Argument. Sustained. I'm sorry. Move it on. Photograph three two zero six. We're continuing to follow that pattern towards the bedroom. The yes. Bathroom. Yeah. The, the picture uh, on the left, it is, you can see the, the pattern coming out of the the hallway and then turning into the, the bathroom area. And then going now in the, on the right side, the pattern is going into the, uh, toward the bathroom. Do we see sort of evidence here of kind of a more thorough cleanup as we get kind of closer to the bathroom? Um, sort of more has been diluted, more has been removed. Well, it, it certainly the, uh, there's not as much blood, but then again, I don't know how much blood was there originally. So again, it's an unanswered question. Uh, photograph 3355. The number 15 here, evidence marker 15, shows you a pair of slacks that appear to have some blood saturation on them. And uh, adjacent to that, you see some well-formed uh, drip stains that have not been altered at all. Um, 
Okay. And photograph 3774 and 3776. Yeah, there you see, there are two closets, one on the left side of the hallway and one on the right, and I believe this was one or the other, male or female closet. Um, and that's simply a transfer stain uh, on just inside the interior wall of the closet, just caused by an object wet with blood that made contact with it. From your review of the entire set of photos, would you be able to say that this particular transfer stain was kind of um, sort of isolated or separate from the main pattern of blood within the house? Yes, it's, it's kind of off by itself uh, for whatever reason. Okay. All right, going to look at the next presentation. And are we now going to focus in on the patterns that were present in the uh, primary bathroom? Okay. You can see the, the, uh, the wiping pattern uh, coming up to and just over the threshold uh, into the bathroom. <clears throat> okay. Um, look at that. Those pants again. Now let's, let's look at the, these two photos and talk about what you're able to um, opine based off of the order of events. Yes, we're looking at the, uh, the interior floor of the bathroom. And you can see there's a, a broken piece of molding here, which uh, actually fits up here when it was all one piece. But what is significant to me is that uh, that piece was broken. And as we've been watching this live testimony from a forensic consultant uh, testifying for the prosecution, Stuart James, I want to bring in now a guest analyst for this hour, Melissa Pinkleton, a retired police sergeant from the Nashville Police Department. Thank you so much for, for being with us, Melissa. Um, as you're listening to this testimony, what is it that strikes you as really being a challenge for investigators? Well, the challenge for the investigators is what he's been describing so much is that there's been so much manipulation of the scene and of the blood and the spatter that it, it is a challenge to try and figure out, okay, it, her story doesn't match, her claim of self-defense doesn't match along with the evidence there. And that's very tricky when she has made several attempts or allegedly made attempts to clean it up or to wipe it or to put uh, wipe it and put other objects over like the table and the lamp that he was describing. So it, it makes it really a lot harder for crime scene investigators when dealing with manipulation of this. Sure, and you know, you obviously been involved in many investigations in your career. Um, what's the first thing that you do when you get to a scene like that, which apparently was so bloody and gory? Yeah, unfortunately, I've, I've been to a lot of scenes like that. I've not been a crime scene tech, but when you get there, first thing you do, we obviously make sure there's nobody that needs any um, medical assistance. But the once you de determine that and see that there's no suspects there on the scene, you back out of the house completely and you secure and you wait for the people who can come in, um, the crime scene techs who can take the pictures and then get that evidence to experts, such as the one on the stand right now, so that that helps the investigation the best they can. Yeah, the work of investigators is so important. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Former Police Sergeant Melissa Pinkleton joining us in Nashville, Tennessee. And we're going to continue our coverage of the Kitchen Knife murder trial, bringing you back live into court. So keep it right here on Court TV. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Joy Lim Nockern in for Julie Grant this afternoon. We continue our coverage of the Kitchen Knife murder trial. Defendant Danielle Redlick is accused of murdering her own husband, Michael Redlick, who also was her stepfather previously. She claims she was acting in self-defense. We've been listening to testimony from a prosecution witness, uh, Stuart James, a forensic consultant, talking about blood patterns found at the scene and also an apparent cleanup. Let's go back live into court example of satellite spatter and satellite spatter by the way uh, very rarely will be more than 15 or 20 inches above the floor because of, its, of the way it's produced and we see it on the baseboard and we see it on the lower wall 
Okay, how did it get there? Well, this area here is clean, but this is the area that would have produced the satellite spatter based on blood dripping in the blood, but it's not there. You cannot get this, you cannot make this pattern without having some additional blood. So at one time there had to have been a pool of blood in that area. A po yeah, a pooling of blood, and I can clarify, a pooling of blood or multiple drops that are close together. And whatever was there is gone. It's gone. And the, 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 satellite, the satellite stains are present, but you cannot tell where the parent area was. Get a, more of a close-up of the satellite stains and kind of this line of demarcation towards the bottom of the floor where it's been... Cleaned. And that becomes a void area. Okay. You can see there's some of the drip stains are, are actually still present over there. But there was much more there to create the satellite spatter on the baseboard to the right. <clears throat> All right, talk to the jury about this uh, collage of photos through, uh, on the next slide, photograph 3451, 3458, 3456. Well, you can see the, the trash can has been dented. I just made that observation. I'm not attaching any significance to it, necessarily. Um, but you see the, the contents of the trash can are being, have been photographed. And you've got the, um, <clears throat> that, Laura, that Laura Mercer box. It's got blood transfer on it. And you've got uh, <clears throat> another, uh, the whitish cloth or something has got some blood transfer on it. Did you have uh, a McDonald's bag, and you also have a, a quarter pounder box which has uh, blood transfer on it. So what, what can you infer about the presence of this blood transfer on the quarter pounder box? Well, it, uh, it was placed in the trash can after blood had been produced on it. And something or someone with blood on them coming in contact with that object? Well, and then someone had to place it in the, in the trash, yes. And then place it in the trash, okay. Um, 3514, what is this uh, stain on this T.G. Lee milk jug uh, an example of? Well, this photograph shows you the container of milk in the refrigerator. And uh, right above the label of Dairy Pure, T.G. Lee, uh, there's a transfer stain, which is very close to the handle where one would attempt to pick up the container. So someone had likely came in contact with that, uh, with that object. Okay, photograph. Um... 3144, just a, sort of an overall shot of the kitchen from an opposite angle. And um, moving towards the sink, what do we see here in the next slide? Well, we see uh, three more evidence markers, uh, five, six, and seven. You see a diluted stain on the edge of the sink with the peripheral rim that's darker that we've seen before. And we see uh, utensils in the sink, labeled five, six, and seven being a knife, and then a, a spoon and a knife, and then number seven, I can't tell right away. It's a, it's a white handle or something. Okay, uh, let's talk about what, what stains, if any, you see on any of these objects inside the um, bathroom, or I'm sorry, inside the sink. Yes, on number five, there appears to be reddish brown staining on the blade. Number seven, there appears to be a small amount of reddish brown staining on the, on the white handle, in addition to the adjacent area in the sink, which would be here. Here, and then, sorry. Oh, sorry. Here, and then as well there. Okay. And um, do we see some patterns that are consistent with uh, the there's appearance more, of blood? Uh, there's more uh, foot impressions, 
which you see several several there in that area. Talk to the jury about the appearance of the stain that we see here in photograph 3505, 3508. Yeah, those stains are, are very odd looking. Um, you can see they've been deposited there. Uh, they, but they've been altered. But I don't think they were altered by anyone in particular. I believe they were deposited such possibly a drip stain uh, and then something. Okay, you've been watching that live testimony in the kitchen knife murder trial. I want to say thank you to Dr. Laura Petler and Melissa Pinkleton for analysis. Handing it off to my colleague, Judge Ashley Wilcott now. Thank you so much, Joy Limnacker, and we're going to get you right back into that courtroom. Live testimony continues right after this quick break here on Court TV, your front row seat to justice.